And joining us on the Mercedes-Benz Vans phone line is the man who wrote the book, literally, figuratively, on Phil Mickelson and a 25-year golf beat writer, if you will, for Sports Illustrated, now a partner at the Fire Pit Collective, Alan Shipnuck here, joining us from Boston, Massachusetts. How you doing, Alan? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Rich. So uh, I just have to give you uh, an idea since you're on the phone. Um, don't be alarmed, but Greg Norman is standing behind me staring at you right now, <laughs> Alan. It's very that, odd. That's an eerily um, familiar feeling, actually. <laughs> it's very, it's very, very, very strange. Um, so I, I just want to jump into that real quick before we get to the here and now with you at the uh, side of the United States Open. Um have you spoken to Greg Norman? Last I heard was about all this is the the text exchange that you had with him after a Live Golf uh, security guard was trying to remove you from Phil Mickelson's post match press conference last week, Alan. Yeah, he never. Greg never responded to my text, and then actually the next day I was walking into the tournament and he was he was coming in my direction with his um, you know public relations slack, and she said, "Hi, Alan." I was like. Oh, hi, Jane. Hi, Greg. And he never looked at me. He just kept marching forward. It was kind of awkward. And then uh, he didn't come in after, you know, could have been one of the crowning moments of his life. He actually launched this live thing and setting aside all the geopolitical uh, questions. I mean, it's pretty impressive what they built from scratch. And, they, you know, he did it. He pulled it off. And I thought he would come into the press room and crow about it. But he was, he was ducking reporters again. So I haven't had any chance to chat things over with Greg and haven't even really made eye contact with him. So it was, you know, I guess it's on brand. He just, he just kind of, um, he just didn't, didn't want to deal with, uh, with me or, or the repercussions of what he had done. So I, I so he, um, is standing behind you as you are being removed from this press conference. You text him about it. He says essentially, Oh, thanks for letting me know. I had no idea. You then text him the photograph uh, showing how he knew exactly uh, what was happening. He knew it had a complete idea. He totally knew. And then he doesn't even respond to that. He just lets, he just, he just ghosts you after that. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> That's a good verb, yeah. An interesting twist in the days afterwards, uh, doing some, just some investigative reporting, which is actually not really, that's too strong a term, but, um, it turns out that it wasn't Greg. This is what I'm told. You know, you have to take all the grain of salt. Sure. But, um, it wasn't Greg who actually called the goons on me. It was actually Phil's people. And Greg could have had some plausible deniability if he wasn't standing right there watching. I mean, it's his show. He could have certainly stepped in and said, uh, Jen, how, how can I help you? Or, you know, he, he was certainly in a, in, a pot, in a position to intervene. He just let it happen. So um, it's kind of you can you can spread the culpability. I mean, it's actually – to me, it's more troubling, really. That, and I'm, you know, again, I don't even know if Phil knew what was going on. He was up there talking, and I was kind of in the back row of the scrum. But you know, he has this overzealous kind of manager, and his swing coach was standing there, and they may have just unilaterally decided um, to make it happen. But it's almost more troubling if it's the player who's ejecting a, a reporter. Like they just don't have that authority. And if, if it's a tournament organizer, they could they could fall back on on some mealy mouth. Uh, credentialing issue or something like that because they do they do control that access but for a player to 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 be in charge of booting out of reporters is even worse in my mind so the whole thing is messy and weird and, and just a monumental overreaction well i mean the, so then let me just ask you what uh you know uh I, some others who when i tweeted about it and spoke about it last week responded with and i'll place it before you since you're telling me uh, you believe Phil's people were the ones who removed you from the press conference, and then we could move on, since I know that reporters don't want to be part of the story. Um, but w what about the idea that you, what else would you, Alan, expect from appearing at a Phil Mickelson press event at the Live Golf Tournament, since it was you who put the quote out there, and you're doing your job, but what about that narrative, Alan? How do you respond to that? Yeah, I mean, Phil doesn't have to answer my questions. He could blow it off, or he could he could he could come back at me. Um, but it, it's it's pretty weak to just not even allow a reporter to stand there and do their job. And uh, you know, it, same same with the tournament organizers. They credentialed me. Like if, if they're going to give me a credential, it makes no sense then 
you know, be tacitly approve the ejection. Like, just if they didn't want me there, they should have credentialed me. And once I'm there, you know, I'm, I'm just going to do my job. And um, if, if we go down this road where players get to vet and approve every question that's asked of them by the by the press, then it's you know, we're, we're lapsing into really weird territory. And, uh, you know, Phil's a pro. He's a master manipulator of the media. You saw that in his press conference at, uh, at, the, at the U.S. Open yesterday. So uh, he, he can handle himself. He, he took a lot of tough questions, and I, I thought he dealt with them pretty well yesterday. So, uh, you know, I was never going to – it was never designed for me to ask him some gotcha question or put him on the spot. I mean, I just wanted to ask him some boring golf stuff. But um, – I don't know. I don't think we want to live in a world where um, athletes have approval of every question they're going to get asked. And that what's the point of even having reporters and it doesn't serve the fans. I mean, we're, we're the fan surrogates. Like we get to ask the players the questions that they would like to have answered. And so um, you're really hurting the fans because then they're just going to get you know, bland, sterilized, uh, boring reporting. It just, it doesn't suit anybody. I mean, it's an entertainment product, the whole thing. I mean, we're not we're not curing cancer here. It's just golf. It's not a big deal. So, um, for them to to try and you know strong arm the whole situation was just weird and unnecessary. Alan Shipnuck here uh, on the Rich Eisen Show. So now that we're at the U.S. Open, a live tournament is in the books. Rory McIlroy, of all people, wins the first PGA Tour event that's running concurrent with the first ever live tour and he shoots a 62 he wins he talks about how he's not got one career win more than greg norman or someone else right he mentions and um so where do where do things stand going into the u.s open week between these two tours alan (laughs) it's not quite civil war but it's, it's heading in that direction i mean I personally love the bitchiness and people throwing shade. Like it's just funny. It's supposed to be such a genteel sport, but it's not. It's not shaping up that way. Um, I mean, it's entertaining. Like, um, it's but it's also very personal. I think Rory's comments made that clear because, you know, if he doesn't want to go to Saudi Arabia, he doesn't want to take their money. But if they poach a lot of the top players, it devalues his whole career. Like he can go and win Jack Nicklaus's Memorial, but if all the best players aren't there it's just not that much fun for Rory. So I think he recognizes this is going to have a direct impact on his, on his tour career and, and all that stuff. So, um, and you know, he, Rory's kind of established himself as the conscience of the sport. And so it comes from, it comes from a very healthy place, but there's also, you know, he's, he's made a business decision, which he's going to line himself with the PG tour and its sponsors. And, and so he's, he's fighting hard for what he believes is right. And, um, but he also, you know, this is this is his career, and so uh, he he sees that if, if the, the tour is in a precarious place, if they lose their players, the, the whole thing be, be, could be, become Triple A baseball very quickly. So uh, it, it's it's a very fraught moment in golf, and it's very chaotic, and it's, it's, it's very interesting. So uh, I don't know if you were flying home or or where you might have been when Jay Monahan appeared in the booth with Jim Nance over the weekend. How do you feel, and I guess what's the general sense as well there at the Open amongst you and your colleagues and the players you're talking to, how Jay Monahan, the PGA Tour commissioner, is handling everything? Yeah, I did. I was like over Greenland at that point, but hmm. I, um, I did watch it uh, after the fact. And, you know, Jay is taking this very personally. You know, he was sort of seething with indignation. And he, he's trying to make this into a moral argument and, you know, saying no one never had to apologize for being a PGA Tour member and th- that sort of stuff. And it's a losing argument. The players have already voted with their feet and their pocketbook. They've been playing in Saudi Arabia for years. They play in China where there's actual concentration camps. They play in Qatar. They play in United Arab Emirates. Like they, they go where the money is. They, the, the players have made that very clear. So Jay's trying to shame them and guilt trip them. It's just not going to work. Um, but he doesn't seem to understand that. And he's been outmaneuvered and sort of outfoxed in every turn. Now, he's also – he doesn't have the artillery. I mean, if, if this is becoming a bidding war, which it is, he can't compete with the Saudis. But, um, you know, I've been saying this for a while, and I think last week made it very evident. The tour is already lost. The sooner they admit that and concede defeat and swallow their pride, the better they are going to be because – Monahan has said he, he won't even take a call from Norman or, or any of the Saudi folks. That's just prideful. I and mean, that's bad business because this is going to 
this the lip tour is happening and it's going to it's going to succeed and the tour can either be relegated to second tier status or the, the the smart thing to do is just forge some kind of strategic alliance that's their favorite term they did it with the european tour already absorb the live events put them all in the fall when there's not very many good pg tour events anyway and then they the, get let, allow the players to maintain their tour membership they can also cherry pick the live events and then it's the best of both worlds for the players they, they get to go to back to pebble beach at the riviera and all their favorite places they get to cash in at these big money live events for the pga tour it's a win they strengthen their schedule they get to keep their stars now and it's for the saudis it's a huge win because they're legitimized by the pga tour which is obviously a, has a very proud respected organization so everybody wins and golf fans get maybe more good tournaments um but that requires the tour to admit that they've already lost and they're very loath to do that because they've drawn this line in the sand that we're the good guys and they're the bad guys and that's a hard negotiating position to be in when you villainize the other people. Like, so I think, um, I, I think, I think Monahan's going to have to figure this out because <clears throat> here, here at, at the country club in, 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 in Boston, there's a lot of talk about who's, who's going to jump next to the Saudis. And there's a lot of great young players who are now in that conversation. And, you know, the first wave where these old timers on the downside of their career who decide to go, go to the live tour and, and the tour could spin that like, well, they're just they're just riding off into the sunset. But you know, Bryson DeChambeau is still a young guy who's not even in his prime. And if you lose a Colin Morikawa and a Xander Shoffley and some of these, these other young talent, uh, the PGA Tour has a huge problem. So uh, this is this is again this is a very this is a very important crossroads um, that Monahan is at, and he, he's going to have to take a different tack because what he's doing is not working. Well. You're at the U, you know, a USGA event this week, and they immediately said when when there was this live tour, um, I guess breakout, and they said everyone could play the U.S. Open. Uh, what about the Royal and Ancient, and what about Augusta? Uh, because it, it, and I understand it's not their fight. I mean, it's just not their fight. Like those organizations put on one tournament a year, right? And it's it, and they care about having the best players, the best field, the best championship. It's not in their interest to get involved in a turf war between rival tours. Like on some level, they don't care. They just want they want their past champions. They want the best players. They want the deepest field. They want the best show for their fans and their TV ratings. So. It's, I think it's a fantastical notion that, that any of these organizations, including Augusta National, is going to ban a bunch of the most popular players in the game, a bunch of Hall of Famers, major championship winners. Like It doesn't serve their interests. So I'm sure they're pushing very hard for a compromise behind the scenes because they just don't want to get involved. I mean, Phil Mickelson and Dustin Johnson are two of the most popular Masters champs of recent years. Why would Augusta not want them there? You know, Bryson DeChambeau is a U.S. Open champion. Uh, you go on, go on down the list. It does not serve the Masters or Augusta National to ban a bunch of players over something that's really not their concern. So, and if, if you want to get really, you know, uh, deep about this, how many Augusta National members have made a fortune with through Saudi Arabia, directly or indirectly? A bunch of them. And do these CEOs want that scrutiny? Like, oh well, your bank does business in Saudi Arabia, but the players can't go over there and take their money too. Like. The inconsistencies become very problematic, and that's just not. I guess the national does not want that smoke. I mean, that's the reason why there's there's women members there now. It's not that all of a sudden they grew a conscience. It's because these CEOs were getting killed for it publicly, saying, "Really, is this what you support?" And they went to the club and said, "You got to change this, man. My shareholders are killing me. I'm getting filleted in the press. Like, they don't want to go down that road again." So. Um, and, you know, now the RNA, they, they can just look to the USGA and their fellow governing body and say, well, the USGA said it was okay, so we're going to do the same thing. Like, the majors are not going to save the PGA Tour. It's just not going to happen. And lastly for you, Alan, um, Alan Shipnuck here on the Rich Eisen Show, a very simple question as Phil is far more subdued than uh, I've ever seen him. And he, he looks like Barry, you know. I don't know if you see the show from HBO. Uh, I mean, oh, yeah. he, I mean, it's just it, it, it's he, he's kind of like the the dark side Bizarro Phil Mickelson walking around now. And I guess I'll just ask this question straight up: Is he all right? What do you think, <laughs> Alan? Well, he, he's you know his mom told USA Today a few weeks ago she'd never seen him happier, and that he's sort of unencumbered. Okay. I mean, I'm paraphrasing. And I think there's something to that. But that was a tough day for Phil. I mean, he, it was like he finally had to face the music. 
and this new reality set in where he's no longer this beloved elder statesman. He, he's burned up a lot of goodwill. Now, the financial incentive for doing so was amazing, you know, $200 million. But um, wow. I think, you know, a lot of these friendly faces that he's jousted with and joked with in the media, all of a sudden, you know, there was an edge in their questions. And he's hearing a little bit from uh, on the grounds from from the fans. And there's some frosty looks in the locker room. And I think this was all theoretical. Now it's real. And there may be some buyer's remorse there. Um, or at the very least, he's realizing that, these cameos of the majors are not going to be as simple as he had hoped. Uh, you know, he can't leave all that baggage at London Heathrow when he flies back from the live event. Like it. So um, I, I think there was a, there was, it was a little bit of a reckoning for Phil. I, I don't know if, if he was thinking, you know, what have I done? But he certainly felt the emotional impact of this decision. And uh, I agree. I mean, he looked, he looked a little defeated, but Phil's proven to be incredibly resilient throughout his whole life and his career. And he, he's bounced back from many controversies and many heartbreaks and he'll settle in this week. And, you know, I'm not sure the casual fan is, is super tuned into this stuff. I, I think if you're a Boston golf fan, you're just happy that Phil's there. You can watch him play and he'll take a little shrapnel, but I think in general, the, the reception will be, people are going to be happy to watch him play golf. And I think they'll feel some love and that, that may, that may lift his spirit. Huh. Yeah. He, he, he looked a little droopy for sure. Because we, you know, we were talking last week, and you know, we'll talk a little bit more throughout the week. Uh, the reception that that Phil might receive, you know, fans are generally forgiving people. I don't know, understand. One of the planes that hit one of the towers left Logan Airport, Alan. Oh yeah, no, I mean that's that's part of the collective memory of Boston for sure. But on another level, if you're a Celtics or a Red Sox fan, you're used to your favorite player leaving for more money. I mean, that's just free agency in sports, right? right. Like your favorite player leaves all the time. And on some level, that's all Phil's done. You know, he, he exercised his crazy rights. And, <laughs> I was about you know, to say, I don't know. Another. Did you see Johnny Damon return to Fenway Park once upon a time, Alan? I mean, it was, uh, it was dicey. <laughs> yeah. Even Wade know, Boggs. They're not, as, they're not as emotionally invested in, <laughs> in Phil in that way. But now, obviously, the, the X factor in this is that the team that Phil is playing for, a lot of people find quite repugnant on, um, you know, where the money comes from. And, and you know, we all know the Saudis are, are bad actors on the world stage. So, that's clearly the complicating factor. If if the live tour was floated by a European bank or, you know, some Australian mogul or whatever it might be, there wouldn't be nearly the same blowback. But there still would be people who felt betrayed. You know, Phil was turning his back on the tour that made him. But there's a whole other element to this where it just feels a little dirty. But um, I don't know. It's going to be fascinating. I mean, I'll be out there on Thursday to take the temperature of the whole thing and and we shall see. I mean, it's 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 going to be an interesting sociological moment for sure. And then the next live tournament tournament is when and and where, Alan? Just yeah, to... two weeks in in Oregon, uh, Pumpkin Ridge Golf Course. And so, you know, a lot of players didn't want to fly over to London the week before um, right. the U.S. Open. But I, it'll be really interesting to see who turns up at at Portland. We already know Patrick Reed and Bryson DeChambeau are going to be there. There and Pat Perez, their recent acquisitions of the live tour. Um, I think some players who may have been considering jumping didn't want to do it, announce it the week of the U.S. Open because it just adds a whole other layer of complication. But I think there'll be more names next week, and uh, anyone who gets announced will, will be in will be in Portland. So I think that field's going to be a lot deeper and more interesting than the first one. And then they'll be suspended by the PGA Tour. That's the way it would work. The minute they announce, they get suspended. That's the way it goes now. Yeah, correct. But that's written in pencil, you know, not in blood. I right. mean, it's all subject to negotiation and hmm. and. Um, you know, they're suspended for now, but we'll see how long that lasts and, and what, how it all shakes out. What a time. Alan, thanks for the time. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, you yeah. know, keep your head on a swivel. You be well. <laughs> all right. Always like talking to you, Rich. Thanks. All right, right back at you. At Alan Shipnuck on Twitter and Instagram right here on The Rich Eisen Show.